tradition let us first bless the word of God as we're going to open it you can say the prayer with me blessed are you O Lord our God King of the universe who has given us the word of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst blessed are you O Lord who gives the scriptures amen and so let's open up our Bible to Exodus chapter 12 <clears throat> Let us begin reading <clears throat> the first three verses. Something of great magnitude in Bible and world history is unfolding right here in this text. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of month for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month... They are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each family. You know, it is here in verse 3 for the first time that Israel is actually called the congregation, the Radat Israel. That is the first time, by the way, this word occurs. Israel has now become a congregation from Genesis chapter 12, where a promise of a new nation was given to Abraham. We now reach Exodus chapter 12, where the birth of this nation is now taking place. And the word Adat, congregation, is very descriptive to the call of Israel. From this, the root word, Ad, which means a witness. It means to point out. And so Israel was chosen to be a witness of God and as a light to the nations. This is her task. And strangely enough, from this word comes the word Ya'ad, which came to designate one woman to be betrothed, to espouse a wife, as it is used in the law later in Exodus. So just from this word, we can perceive the future of Israel, her task and her position with God. Later in the Torah, in the book of Numbers 27, she is even called Adat Jehovah, the congregation of Jehovah. Right? It had become his assembly, his wife-to-be. But see that, just like it is with the believers today, because we are also called the bride of Christ. Our history is there as well. Another word used for Israel is found in verse 6 also of Exodus 12. It's called the assembly of the congregation of God. Kahal, where we get the word kehilat, for a gathering like ours. And so reaching Exodus 12, something has changed in the history of the Bible despite the fierce persecution and the many attempts to do away with Israel, God's plan cannot be altered. And with this new section, a brand new way of life develops for the Israelites. A new calendar and a new, new laws are given to the nations. Let's see verse 2 again. See what it says. This month, shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Notice how this is insisted on. Three times the word month or new moon in Hebrew is repeated in this one verse. Because from this point on, the people are to be different. They are to be distinct for now they belong to God. This calendar will protect them from the influence of the Canaanites, actually, where they were going to cohabit with in the land of Israel. So to have a different calendar, they cannot be their friends. And what is the word? For you, to you, these things are these things. For it was only for the nation of Israel. Again, if we don't have the same holidays, if we don't eat the same food, then we cannot become friends. This is the object of this new calendar to allow Israel to be sanctified until it is ready to proclaim the word of God. In the new sets of law, they will be given soon. Many of them were designed to make them even look so different from the others. Men were to wear payats, right? They, they were not to shave the corners of the head so they would look different. Jesus had payats, by the way. That was the law. Israel were towards tzitzit, that is the fringes on, on their side. So they look different and so that they will not be able to mingle and to get lost into the crowd. They would know who they are. Jesus wore the tzitzit as well. 
And so this new calendar with a different new year is a great symbol of change. But do you see how this turning point in the life of Israel touches so much our lives as believers today? Are we not told as well to be different so that we we'll not only be affected by the things of this world, but so that we can be an example of light unto them? What, a new, what is a new calendar for us? How does it translate? It's like a new schedule, a new perspective, a new way of living. Once a believer, we cannot follow the ways of this world. This is what we learn here. The scripture tells us that you, speaking to all believers, were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ephesians 5.8. That is the purpose of the changes we're about to witness in Exodus for Israel. And this change from darkness to light, as Jesus spoke to Paul on the road to Damascus, right? There lies our best witness. We can argue about science. We can argue about sin. But the best way to refute the critics is to produce the evidence of a changed life. A changed life is the evidence of our salvation. And this growth is not a one-time deal. It lasts the whole life of a believer here on earth. I don't know if you notice in the history of the people in the scriptures, Abraham, Paul, Moses never stopped being tested and challenged and never stopped being trained for eternity. Yes, we are in a school of training here on earth. We are being trained for a better life. The New Testament sees the believer as an athlete, right? Always competing, not against others, but against the attraction and riches of this world. And the life of an athlete is one of the most disciplined you can find. In order to succeed, an athlete needs to follow a structure training plan. Do we have one? Do we pray? Do we read? Do we study every day? The athlete is one who understands proper nutrition and hydration. Do we, how, what do we feed our brain? Are we careful about things we read and watch and even the friends that we have? An athlete is one who has developed a new mindset and this is done through perseverance and resilience. Have we come to the point to be able to, to say like Job or to say like Paul to, to, that we have masters our evil thoughts? To be able to say, I take my thoughts in captivity, like Paul says. The believer is very much those powerful salmons. You know those fish salmons which swim upstream, opposing the flow of water. It would be so much easier to stay where they were. But believers are called to be likewise, always growing and being trained for a much better life up there. And so... As we are faced with the story of the Israelites leaving Egypt, it also becomes our story as we too must leave the things of this world into a new journey towards the promised land. This is why Paul uses the word example when referring to the history of Israel. He used it twice in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where he says that these things became an example that happened to them as examples. So we have a wealth of information right there for us. The same one God who was with them in Egypt is the one who is with us today and he has the same desires for us. He wants us to have a sanctified and well-prepared and ordered life. And consider Egypt, <clears throat> Mitzrayim, which is often a symbol of the world in the Bible. You know, it is mentioned 681 times just in the Hebrew Bible. We see it with Abraham. Right after receiving the Abrahamic promise in Genesis 12, Abraham headed to Israel, but he went right through to Egypt. This is the first time we hear of Egypt as a country. There Abraham was attracted, but he was not supposed to be there. This is when he lied about his wife, being his sister, and put her life and the life of the promised seed at stake. And then 400 years later, we find Israel in Egypt here in Exodus. And the deliverance from Egypt is commemorated over and over throughout the scriptures, even through the book of Hebrews. And see what the word Egypt means. 
The word Mitzrayim comes from the word Matzor, meaning a siege, a blockade. That is a fitting definition for one is always attracted to the riches of Egypt, the riches of the world, and its lures seems to block our exit or way out. However, we will soon learn that many Israelites actually came out of Egypt, but they brought Egypt along with them. Like those believers who cannot make a clean break from the evil influences of this world. Now, concerning the country Egypt, while it does <coughs> represent the world, in the end times, Egypt has a great future. And I want to tell you that, by the way, because we will hear a lot about Egypt. Through those many nations will just disappear because of their evil, like the nation of Edom. Egypt will thrive in the messianic time. The prophecy of Isaiah 19, verse 23 to 25, tells us that from Egypt to Iraq, we're going to have a, a highway going through, right? And God, the Lord actually mentions that it's beautiful. So it's going to go through actually the land of Israel. Imagine there would be that beautiful highway going through. These are some wonderful times ahead. This is part of the end time prophecies, uh, by the way. Now back to the new calendar. Something very unusual is really surprising happened to Israel throughout the history. Something we usually bring out every feast of Rosh Hashanah in October. If the new year given by God to Israel is in March, April, that is in the month of Nisan, why is it that today Jews around the world celebrate the new year on the seventh month in Tishrei? That is in September, October. Why? Why the change? When questioning the rabbis and scholars concerning this issue, they usually answer, the answer you get is that there are two Jewish New Years. One in the fall and one in, in the spring. This is the civil New Year in the fall and the spring is the religious New Year. You know, this is fine. That's absolutely fine. But why is it that we never hear about the religious New Year that is in March, April? Why? The new year at Passover when God himself put so much emphasis on it in Exodus chapter 12. Imagine you celebrate a birthday all your life and then find out that the date is wrong. This is what happened. Most Jews are surprised, and myself also before I became a believer, most Jews are surprised to find out that this is the only new year found in the Bible. That is the new year that we find in Exodus chapter 12. And there's a reason for it. It's not given a miss. If God decided to make the Passover the new year, it is because there are good reasons for it. For there we see the importance of the Lamb of God, the Messiah himself. That is, the, that is what the Passover is about. The Passover is one of the most descriptive prophecy of the work of the Lamb of God who is Yeshua HaMashiach. And to keep this memory alive in the individual, God changed the new year to Passover so we can always celebrate our salvation. And so the others would know where the salvation is. Now let's look at the, the, the commandments about the lamb. Look at a few of them for today. Let's read verse 3 to 5. And try to count how many times the word lamb is mentioned. Because this is what Passover is about. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying in the... On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's family. A lamb for each family. Now, if the family is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according that, to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished lamb, male for year old that is a year old you may take it from the sheep or the goats so it is here where we first read about the lamb in the book of exodus by the way how many times five times in these three verses we have the word lamb say say this is the hebrew word but the first mention, do you remember the first mention of the lamb in the Torah? Because people who read this, the, you know, in Exodus chapter 12, they will remember right away that in Genesis chapter 22 was the first mention of the lamb in there. 
It was during the binding of Isaac, something we have seen last week. It was there where Isaac asked about the lamb to be sacrificed. And there his father answered and told him that the Lord would provide. And it is here in Exodus 12 where we begin to see the fulfillment of this promise. Let us first see how beautifully the details of the lamb are given to us. First, it was to be unblemished without any defect. Because it was a sacrifice and in order to be able to cover our sins, even temporarily, it was to be tam in Hebrew, that is perfect, as Yeshua was perfect and sinless. This is why it was chosen on the 10th of the month and kept four days at home until the 14th of the month to make sure that it was fit to offer. And the reason is given in Exodus 12, 6. This is what it says, you shall keep. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. The word keep, mizmeret, in Hebrew means keep watch, guard closely, examine. So the whole family was asked to keep a close eye on the lamb for four days. But there's some consequences to this already. Let me ask you a question. What happens when you keep a gentle lamb at home for so many days and then you have to kill it? What happens? You get attached to it and the children as well and then you have to kill it. You know, I want to tell you, there were some recent studies about farmers who would get so attached to their animals and found it very hard to sell them off for meat. They say that animals and especially lambs Right? develop relationships and some strong emotional bonds with humans. Imagine the lamb wouldn't want to leave home, right? But more than these farmers, I want to tell you, the Israelites had to keep the lamb in their homes. And then they were asked again to sacrifice it. Cruel, you might say. But so was the death of the Messiah. That's the idea. Who more than a lamb willingly sacrificed himself for us. Him who was love incarnate. This is where the lamb brings us. And in many ways, we still are living the spirit of four days, by the way. Because the more one learns about Yeshua in the word of God, in prayer, in communion, okay, the more one realizes how innocent and loving he is. And in the same way, as the Israelites' families must surely have felt so bad in killing it, so do we when we realize that he died for our sins. And it is perhaps the same feeling that Yeshua brought back to the people. You know when he told them this very hard saying in John 6, 53. Verily I, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh and the, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. What did he mean by that? Offensive, is it not? But where exactly is the offense? It is in man. It is in his sins. That is what the Israelites were called to experience, the, the cruelty of sin. For sin brings death and great beauty of the story of the Bible is that the Messiah takes these offenses unto himself so that we may be saved, as simple as this is. This part of the process of salvation, recognizing sin first and how abusive it is to God first. And so from Genesis 22 to our text in Exodus 12, we can follow the Lamb's path throughout the Nevi'im, throughout the prophets. Isaiah was the first one to directly connect the Lamb to the Messiah. He saw him like a Lamb that is led to the slaughter in Isaiah 53.7. The same expression is used by Jeremiah prophesying of the Messiah who said, But I was like a gentle Lamb led to the slaughter, Jeremiah 11.19. And then some 550 years later, the last Jewish prophet, John the Baptist. Once seeing Jesus approaching, he says, Behold, here is the Lamb of God. Twice he said that. You know, in both Isaiah 53 and in Jeremiah 11, we have the same expression, the same conclusion when they said, Let us cover him off from the land of the living. This is what the people said about the Messiah. 
And he was cut off from the land of the living. That is, he died. He was sacrificed as the Passover lamb, but is now, I want to tell you, resurrected, and he appears in the book of Revelation, and he's coming, you know how? As a lamb as well, to offer again salvation to these people. You know that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called the lamb over 30 times, because salvation is still opened, but it will stop at some point. Now back to Exodus. Look at the days of the month chosen. The 10th for the chosen of the lamb and the 14th for the sacrifice. Two important days in the history of the Bible. The first dimension of the 10th day marks a new era. The Bible often associates the 10th day of the month with freedom and with liberty. It was on the 10th of the first month, same as it is here, that the waters of the flood began to recede and that the mountains became visible. This they could see already salvation through the sacrificed land. This is in Genesis 8.5, by the way. In Leviticus chapter 25, we learn that the year of Jubilee, that is the year when the clock is reset and everyone is freed from death and everyone is called to go to, to take their possession of their ancestral inheritance occurs on the 10th of the month, this time on the 7th month. Later, Ezekiel received the vision of the temple of the millennium on the 10th of the first month, like it is in Exodus. 10 is one of the perfect numbers and signifies a perfection of divine order and it is on this day that he asked the Israelites to choose a Passover lamb. And for the date of the sacrifice, the 14th of the month, this date also brings us to consider so many things. The 14th of the month of the biblical year is actually a full moon, full moon. This is when the earth is between the sun and the moon and we witness the light of the sun shining in fullness in the moon, on the moon. This is when the moon is at its brightest. So surely the Israelites had much light from the moon to see the Passover lamb. You know that later this number then was associated with the salvation of Israel. We can see the importance of this number in the New Testament. It uses this, this number to highlight four major different occurrences in the history of Israel. This we find right in the first book of the New Testament, in the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1. This is how the Spirit of God divided the history of Israel in Matthew 1.17. It says, so all the generation from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the, departure, the deportation to Babylon, actually to Yeshua, there are also 14 generations. And so in this genealogy, every 14th generation, we have a highlight. First, Abraham, to whom the promise was given. Second, to David, from whom the seed was to come. Third, the unfortunate deportation of Babylon, which began actually the current diaspora, which hasn't ended yet. Then Yeshua who comes as the remedy, the salvation, as he himself was crucified on the 14th of Nisan, the same time as the Passover lamb was sacrificed. Now as for the lamb itself, and this is beautiful, see that the lamb was to be shared between families. It had become a, a unifying element in Israel. Verse 4. God says, now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Now how many people can feed on the lamb? This is when we go to history. According to the Targum, according to Josephus, it was 10 people per lamb. Right? And we learned that the night of the sacrifice on the 14th of Nisan, all the 10 people or so were to be in one home, feasting the meal. They were not to leave the home until actually the morning. Here we have, by the way, like a first type of the breaking of bread. Families of the same faith and hope getting together to eat the lamb and the bread of affliction while expecting to see God's deliverance. 
Later, Passover was chosen as one of the feasts when every Jew from all over the world was required to come to the temple and to eat the Passover right there and then in front of God. Today, we, we do the same every time we eat by inviting Yeshua at our table and ask him to bless our food, to bless our bread, commemorating the great work of salvation he has done for us. Now, just imagine the number of lambs sacrificed, by the way. But if there were two million Jews, right, uh, at, at the temple in Jerusalem and also in, in the Exodus, uh, you can imagine that they had to slaughter 200,000 lambs. That's a lot of lambs. During the temple time, the historian Josephus uh, writes that there were actually 250,000 lambs sacrificed, and to facilitate the sacrifices, uh, they had actually uh, to, to divide the people into three different groups. This is based actually on Exodus 12. The rabbis saw that the Israel is called the congregation, an assembly, and the Israelites. Right? And so they said, we divide them in three groups. So the Tamil reports that they would bring the first group and lock the doors. They will first blow the shofar and, and the temple singers will actually sing the Hallel, Psalm 113 to 118. At the same time, the priests will collect the blood on basins and put it on the altar. At the end, every family in Jerusalem had their lamb to celebrate. But I'm going to tell you, the deeper one looks at this chapter of Exodus 12, the more Yeshua, Jesus, emerges. See verse 7. God says, Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. First, see how the blood is placed on the two doorposts. The Hebrew word for doorpost, many of you are familiar with it. It is the word mezuzah. This is how we recognize the Jewish homes when we go give out the Bibles. The blood is to be placed on the lintel and of the house, right, and on the doorpost. But this is not the full picture, by the way. There is another element added when we consider verse 22. This is what it says. <coughs> You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel of the two doorposts and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. You see the word basin? The word Hebrew is saf. It also designates the threshold of the home. 25 times it is used for a threshold and only 7 times for basin. So it refers mainly to the threshold of the house and it is on this threshold where the lamb actually was sacrificed that is why ancient rabbis in the Talmud Jerusalem Talmud would say that our forefather had four altars in Egypt the two doorposts the lintel and the threshold this is just like it was at the tabernacle and at the temple the altar of sacrifice was right at the entrance and so the home had become at this point in time like the temple itself <coughs> this would continue until the tabernacle was constructed and later the temple, the tabernacle, the temple, the tabernacle were then to become the only places where sacrifices were taking place. So the picture is complete with this. The Israelites were protected from all sides, east, west, north, side, left, right, up and down. God is above all on the sides and carries his people from below in the palm of his hand, right to their final destination. That's again the message of Passover. And this brings us to consider the word Passover, Pesach. An important word used seven times just in this chapter of Exodus. Its fair occurrence first is in verse 13. It says, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood I will pass over, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is when we encounter again the word Pesach, Passover, which gave birth to the English word Paschal, right? Used to designate the Passover lamb and Eastern celebration. There are three meanings, by the way, to this word, and all connected to each other. Many understand that the first meaning is to protect, is to have protection, that is compassion. And this meaning fits well with the full protection of the blood around the doors of the homes. The other meaning is to skip over also. 
as the word Passover is. So to save and to protect, right? So it is to protect, to have compassion, and also to skip over. And how were the Israelites eat the Passover on this special night of the 14th of Nisan? I want to tell you, we're going to recognize ourselves in this commandment. We're going to close with this. Let's read verse 11 of chapter 12. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. See the urgency as the moment of departure was approaching? They did not know when exactly it would happen, but they were called to be ready to go at any time. And so the Israelites were to wear a belt and to have their sandals on and to eat fast. Paul uses the same image in this description, remember, of the armor of God. To encourage the believer to always be ready to go to the promised home that we have in heaven. And so the first mention, he first mentioned the belts so that anyone ready to live should wear one. For him, the belt was the belt of truth. Here, truth speaks of the whole body of the scriptures itself. It is the teaching of it. It is its doctrine. This is the first thing that is needed in the armor of God. It is the truth of the word of God. The Israelite wore it by faith, of course. And why a belt? You remember a weightlifter wears a belt before he can lift very heavy things. So we need the word of God. We need faith. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit among us in order to be lifting up and to do great things. For him and also that they were told to wear their sandals not only does that prepare you to live at any moment but the idea of readiness is further enhanced by the shoes found in verse 15 of Ephesians 6 is to have shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace the Greek word for the gospel is the same as the word to evangelize that is to proclaim we can read it like this having put on your shoes for the proclamation of the word of God <coughs> but this is exactly what Israel was ready, getting ready for to be a priestly nation and a light unto the world just like the believer today and so the shoes are the foundation we stand on and our foundation should be made of the peace of the Messiah. I love this verse I want to share with you, Isaiah 32, 17. The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Peace is that one thing that should characterize the believer. And because we have, <coughs> because we have that peace, then we can communicate it to others. Paul may have had Roman soldiers in mind when he wrote Ephesians, but he surely had also the Passover in mind. And how is this evening called, by the way? Look at Exodus 12, 42, the night of vigil. It is a night of vigil unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. A night of vigil unto the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generation. This was the night, by the way, preceding their departure. The night of vigil was an important ritual in the first century, mentioned especially in the Dead Sea Scroll. But today it's almost gone. In the Gospel, by the way, the night of vigil was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We remember that Jesus went to the disciples three times to wake them up. And he told them, keep watch, keep watch, and keep watch. Watch. He tells us the same thing because we're living this night of vigil, especially today, as the Messiah is coming very, very soon. And so the believer in many ways is right now again living this night of vigil. There's an urgency of being prepared as the Lord is coming imminently, that is, at any time now. So this importance is not new. It is not because we're in the end times, but it was always there with men and women of God. They were also always eagerly waiting for the Lord and always doing the work so fast as if the Lord was coming that very day. And this is such a great hope to carry with us all the time, knowing that he's coming soon. Amen. Let's bow ahead in prayer. I will combine the prayer of Habakkuk and of Jude. 
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. By your word, you sanctify us. And through your infinite love and kindness, you take great delight in us and give us your spirit. We thank you for these great prophecies and types that we find in the Torah and all the scriptures, things you have put in your word to enlighten us. And so we say, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, our Father, for there is no one like you. And now, Lord, bless our hearts. Cleanse us from any wrong motives. Put away our sadness, our problems, and make us free so that we can reflect your glory to others. And now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. To the only God and Savior, through Messiah Yeshua our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. amen.